In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Lord. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave me of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death. Of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And righteous are your just decrees. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love, and teach me your statutes. The Old Testament lesson is from the book of Proverbs, the 25th chapter. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring into court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another's secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you and Ill, your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to be the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. One day, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. Peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. 
Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In both the epistle reading and the gospel reading, there is a word that inspired by the Holy Spirit, both Matthew, I'm sorry, St. Luke and St. Paul use over again and again. And that little word is kaleo. It's a Greek word that has an English cognate. In fact, you can probably guess the word just by the original Greek. Kaleo, to call or to invite. You, dear Christians, have been called by the gospel. The Lord himself has called you to live in a certain way, to believe in him, to confess the truth, and to receive his gifts here with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You have been kaleod. You have been called. In response to the scribes and the Pharisees, however, and their self-righteous behavior, trying to trap Jesus into a loophole of the law, Jesus uses this word to call in a way that emphasizes both the law and the gospel. Because those who think that they come to the Lord's banquet on their own without having been invited, boldly barging in, thinking that they deserve a place at his table by their own strength, worthiness, or merit, that calling judges. Because again, no one can say Jesus is Lord except those who have received the Holy Spirit, those who have been called by the gospel, even as we confess in the meaning to the third article of the creed, where we who believe in the work of the Holy Spirit confess, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, but he has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctifies and kept me in the one faith. This is the work of God. This is what creates humility in us, knowing that we are here by the Lord's invitation and not because of some strength in our own heart or desire in our mind. No, instead, it is all God's doing for you. He calls us to be here. Now, remember those Pharisees, they thought that they deserved a place before the Lord. In fact, they assumed that the Lord would come and fawn over them and all that they had done in living their religious lives. In fact, the Pharisees are the most religious of all the people living in Judea at that time. Now today, we think being religious is bad. It's a pejorative. Jesus is my savior, not my religion, people will say. But it's not bad being religious. On the contrary, it's very good. We should take our faith seriously and live out our calling very religiously, coming to church, hearing God's word, and yes, doing good for others. Because to be religious means to follow and to adhere to something with strong commitment and zeal. And if you're going to be committed to anything in this world, it should be to the word of God. If we have any zeal, it should be to love God with our whole heart, mind, body, and soul. And yes, love our neighbors as ourselves. But the sad reality is that those uber-religious Pharisees living 2,000 years ago had made up their own laws for themselves. They'd become puffed up with pride. And so they looked down on everybody else, thinking that everybody else should look up to them. And so the Lord has to correct that, that erring behavior. And he does it by reminding them that when invited to a banquet, don't lord over others. Don't take a place at the top assuming that's where you belong. Now remember, our Lord's parable here is not simply table manners or good etiquette when you go to a wedding reception, although it is that. Rather, it is something far more. It reminds you of a greater banquet to which the Lord invites you. You see, those Pharisees, they wanted to dine with Jesus on their own terms. They wanted Jesus to be thrilled with them because they had made time for him. In their pride, they expected him to make a fuss over them because they had invited him in. Sometimes, we think we deserve special attention from Jesus because we've made him Lord of our life or invited him into our hearts. 
except that we know that you can't do that. It's impossible. Dead in your trespasses, you can't choose Jesus, so he chooses you. From before the very foundation of the world, your Lord has planned for your salvation, and he has planned to call you through the preaching of the gospel, and only through the gospel, and nothing else. That word of God that brings you what you need most, your Savior, high and lifted up upon the cross for you to see. And why was the Lord placed there? On account of your sins. You see, that brings us in humility here as well knowing that the law condemns us, that our sins are like scarlet, that we have broken the fifth commandment. We may not have murdered by actually taking a gun out and shooting any, somebody, but certainly in our hearts, we have not always put the best construction on things. We have not always spoken kindly to one another. We heard a horrible example of this kind of murder this past week in several ways. The presidential debate was atrocious, and the response to President Trump's coronavirus affliction is even more atrocious. And so we can judge and condemn. We condemn people for having too little pigment or too much pigment in their skin. We condemn and judge people who have more or less education than we have, a better job or a worse job. We look down on people in many ways because of their accent or what neighborhood they're brought up in or what country they come from. Lord, have mercy. The law shows us that we have all sinned and fallen short. So nobody dare judge anybody else. And rather, with humility, take our seat here in this place at the banquet the Lord calls us to, eager to receive what we need most, not just the healing of some physical ailment. God gives us earthly medicine, doctors and hospitals for that. Instead, we come here expecting a greater healing, a healing from above that comes with water, and word, bread and wine that has been blessed by Christ's own word so that we receive the medicine of immortality, the very bread of life, which God Christ gives us is of his own body and blood to eat and to drink so that we are here invited to a wedding banquet that is the fulfillment of the parable. And yet a greater fulfillment awaits because we know on the last day when we die and go to heaven, we will sit before the Lord and we will be with him and see him for who he is face to face, our Lord and Savior, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world by his death and sacrifice. And that Lord who sacrificed so much has called you here so that you would receive his mercy, his grace, and his love. Because yes, there are times when we do need to be corrected, corrected under the law that reminds us that, again, we've not always put the best construction on things. We have held grudges in our hearts. We have looked down upon others. And yet, remember the word of the Lord spoken by wise King Solomon in the Proverbs. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. And what a wonderful thing the king of all creation, has called you out of sin and the darkness of the valley of the shadow of death, and he has lifted you up, given you a place in his kingdom, given you a seat at his table to recline with him, to come and kneel and to receive what the Lord offers you in the bread and wine, nothing less than his own body and blood. Because remember, you have been purchased not with gold or silver, but with his own innocent suffering and death, with something more precious than gold or your good works, the work of Christ, his obedience for you. And believing that with Paul, we can agree, I, therefore, am a prisoner for the Lord because we have been bought and paid for. Again, not by our efforts or doing, but by the Lord himself out of his great love for us. And yes, held captive to the word, what can we do but repent and rejoice and forgive as we have been forgiven? Yes, Paul, he was imprisoned for preaching Christ, imprisoned for proclaiming the good news that is an offense to those whose hearts are hardened like the Pharisees. But the good news of the gospel is exactly what melts the heart, brings faith, life, and salvation to those who despair of their own goodness and who rejoice in the salvation won for them by Jesus. And the result of that joy is a new way of living, of giving thanks, of forgiveness, of turning the other cheek, of going the extra mile to love those whom previously we might thought of as unlovable. Because you have been set apart, chosen by God, separated from the world in its ways, 
again, not to live for yourselves any longer, but to live for Jesus by loving him and showing love to others as well, even those whom we are tempted to look down upon. As prisoners of the Lord, Paul tells us, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that humility, for all the Lord has done for us, not trying to avoid his word or weasel out of keeping his commandment to love others, we are to heed his word rather than the desires of our own foolish hearts. In obedience to him, we are to walk in his ways as his chosen people are called to do. And yes, be his servants in this world, loving our neighbor, fulfilling the commandments in his name as we live out our various vocations, not bearing grudges or looking down on us for the healing, forgiveness, life, salvation, and the good daily bread that he chooses to give those around us. But again, rejoicing in his mercy and thanking him for everything, even those things which can cause us to suffer. Because that's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord, to trust him when it appears that everything is going wrong. Because no longer chained to the law for our salvation, but set free from its impossible demands, we are free to live as God's holy people, knowing that everything he does, he does for our good. And therefore we praise him for his sacrifice for us and for our salvation which released us from death and the power of the devil himself. And this blessed reality gives us joy, even in the midst of cross-bearing, even as St. Paul wrote, and even as we confessed our faith together in the Nicene Creed, which reflects Paul's words, there is one body and one spirit, just as we are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You see, in your baptism, you have been given something precious, more precious than gold or silver, something that is so precious that no amount of earthly money can buy it. Water and word washing over you for the forgiveness of sins that rescues you from death and the devil and gives eternal salvation to you who believe this as the word and promises of God declares. But remember, what does such baptizing with water indicate? Are we to go back to our own sinful ways in order that grace may abound, as Paul warned against? Of course not. It indicates that the old Adam should by daily contrition and repentance be crowned and die with all sin and evil desires and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Because as wise Solomon wrote, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. And this is why the Lord told the parable. Knowing our own sin and lack of humility and love for others, we dare not demand a place at the head of his table or think that we deserve a place there. Instead, we take comfort in these words. We are but unworthy servants. And the Lord's word, when he says, you were invited, go sit at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. You have been baptized into Christ, and in your baptism, he has reached out of heaven to lift you up out of the very death and depths of hell itself. Even as he was high and lifted up on the cross for your salvation, you have life in his name. He has healed you eternally with the greatest miracle you can receive this side of his return in glory. He has forgiven your sins, and he has taken that act out of your hands and placed it upon himself. Because in his calling, what he did on the cross, he has given to you as a gift in this great exchange of your unrighteousness for his righteousness. And in his righteousness given to you, having been made righteous, the waters of holy baptism now clothe you. And in clothing you with that gift, you have a place with him in heaven. He chose to do this not because of some great achievement of your own doing or some perfection of your heart or even your obedience to the Ten Commandments but rather because in your weak flesh you needed this gift, you needed this forgiveness, and you needed this healing. And so calling and inviting you through the gospel, he has given you a place of honor that is his to give to whomever he chooses. And your Lord chooses to have you come and sit here with him and dine at his table. 
each one of you having received a crown of life in heaven, you are sons and daughters of the king, and you are God's holy priesthood, and he sees you as holy and beloved. Now certainly the day will come when this short life is ended, and our Lord will lift us up from this veil of tears. The day will come when he calls us to himself in heaven and carries us up out of this valley of the shadow of death. But until that day comes, he lifts you up this day, Again, gives you a place in that heavenly banquet with angels and archangels and the entire company of heaven, where those who have gone to the church triumphant, we who still wrestle against the flesh and against the devil and against the world around us, know that we have been exalted by Christ. And that is what creates true humility, that the Lord chooses to make us who do not deserve it his own beloved brothers and sisters, children of God, adopted by the Father from heaven so that we can come to the sacrament of the altar and receive the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink so that we can know beyond a doubt that our sins have been forgiven and that we've been fed and healed by God himself. Because the divine service which we attend is the wedding feast here on earth to which you have been called by the Lord, provided by him. It's where he gives you a place to kneel with the other forgiven, restored, thankful, believing saints and receive what he offers for your eternal good. And not just with those who kneel here at this table, but again with angels and archangels, because you have been declared righteous by God himself. So not boasting in our own merits, worthiness or goodness, we boast in the Lord, our Savior and all that he has done to bring peace with God through his own innocent body and precious blood shed for us so that we humbly rejoice and trust in his words. For we do believe that the Lord gives us a meal that provides a more miraculous healing than any in the Bible because what the Lord gives you this day is for you. It's here from him as he raises you up to a place at his table on this day of rest. Because yes, the Lord Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And on this Lord's Day, we celebrate the day he defeated death in the grave and his rising again has proved his lordship even over those horrible maladies that afflict all people, death itself. And that's why with humble joy, we come and kneel before him and hold out our hands and open our mouth, daring to be fed by the Lord because we know that he has forgiven us and he calls us, and he gathers us, he enlightens us, so that we can trust his word, call upon his name, and rejoice that he is here with us, having been exalted by him, lifted up to a place of honor, and we have received incredible gifts from above. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. You have been watching the Divine Service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. You're also invited to join us for Vespers and Catechesis for the entire family on Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. Holy Cross is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and is located at 1100 Market Street, Carlisle, Iowa.